Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Dr Zoe Jacobs. In today's episode, we'll be joined by Dr Tammy Horton on a voyage to meet the monsters of the deep in the mysterious Discovery Collections. Welcome, Tammy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, it's a pleasure. Good, it's good to see you. Um, so before we kind of get into it, um, I wonder if you could tell me a bit about your career and your role at NOC, because um, I believe you have two main roles here. Yeah, that's right. So I started here at NOC in 2001, so I've probably been here a very long time now. <laughs> and um, I came directly after my PhD. So I oh, wow. had done a PhD on something completely unrelated to deep sea science yeah. and completely unrelated. I was looking at... Um, Parasitic isopods that live in the oh mouths right. of fish. So oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So there rather strange. Um, <laughs> and there was a new species to the UK. Mm -hmm. And I spent quite a lot of time at the Natural History Museum in London. And that's where I learned about taxonomy okay. and the study of understanding how to determine what species things are. Right. So identifying animals yeah. and also describing animals new to science. Oh, cool. Sounds so, really interesting. So that was my introduction yeah. to taxonomy and um, crustaceans, these uh, animals, some of which we have in front of us here. Um, but I started at the NOC in 2001 on a fellowship, um, which was to study the biodiversity of the deep sea. Mm -hmm. And I continued working at NOC for many years um, on a number of different projects. So I eventually took over looking after the discovery collections in about 2013. Okay. And so now I have, yeah, a dual role. So I, yeah. I balance my own research, uh -huh. which is on describing new species yeah. of deep sea crustaceans, um, with looking after these oh, many, wow. many specimens in the discovery collections. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So what are the discovery collections? So <laughs> the discovery collections, right. Um, well... Um, they've got a long history and the mm -hmm. discovery collections are essentially all of the biological samples and specimens that have been collected by the ships named Discovery mm -hmm. and all of the other ships that the institutes who held the right. ships named <laughs> Discovery. <laughs> lots of ships. So, well, lots of ships. So <laughs> although it's called the Discovery uh, yeah. Collections um, and it was named after the ships, um, there have been a number of other ships alongside, so yeah. it's not only Discovery. Yeah. So I have to add that little, yeah. uh, little, <laughs> little thing course. in there, which says, you know, don't forget about the yeah, Challenger exactly. ships and Very the James Cooks and all of these <laughs> other ships. Yeah. But yes, all of the biological samples that are collected by those ships come okay. back and have always come back to um, a collection of biological specimens, and that is what makes up the Discovery collections. So why do we have it? Well... Well, yes, why? Why yeah. do we keep all why? these things in jars? <laughs> well, <laughs> a lot of people think it's quite strange to keep deceased animals in jars for posterity. <laughs> but there is a scientific reason, there are lots of scientific reasons why we do so. So a, a sample of animals from a point in time and point in space um, provides us a picture of what lived there at that time. Right. right? If we go back even the next the next day, the next week, certainly in the next year, mm. we'll find something different there, more than likely, a completely different community. So we keep these specimens so that we can study the communities that live in a particular area at a particular place and in time and space. Mm. So it provides us with a scientific understanding of mm. what lives in our oceans. That's one of the things, but there's yeah. so many more things, so yeah, many more imagine. reasons why we keep specimens. Yeah. So you say uh, we talked about all of these, all of these kind of specimens have come from like so many different ships. And um, I know there have been quite a few discoveries. So how long have we been collecting these specimens? Right. Well, some of our the, the first ever expeditions um, down to the Southern Ocean and Antarctica yeah. um, began in 1925. Oh, wow. And I can show you. I've got this fantastic volume here, which was published, I think, in 1929, which is oh, the Discovery cool. Investigations, Objects and Equipment. Wow. And so that's, methods. So that's nearly, nearly 100 years ago then. Yeah. So we're almost at 100 years since we started that's collecting exciting. things for the Discovery Collections. And if we look inside this uh, beautiful book, um, and I'm showing you now um, a picture of the Royal Research Ship Discovery. Oh, now wow. This is the first iteration of the discovery. Oh, and wow. And that went to um, 
that on the first commission of the Discovery Investigations to the Southern Ocean for a, on an expedition lasting two years. Now, can you imagine that being? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just I'm, I'm, all I can think right now is that looks very different to the Discovery that I that I know. <laughs> exactly. So there's been four iterations of yeah. the Discovery vessels yeah. now. So we're on Discovery four. Yeah. I like to say so. Oh, wow. Discovery one, this one, lasted the first yeah. two years and still collected a lot of the specimens and samples, including what I'm holding up now. This one here was collected in 1927. So this was Ooh, so collected. Is on that one of the oldest or the oldest? Specimen? It's one of the oldest, yeah. not the oldest. It's one of the oldest one ones of we have in our collections here in Southampton. And this is um, some rather large barnacles, um, which were collected at the surface, actually. And we're not sure exactly where... It well, we have the, the station data here. So every single specimen that we have has information about the stations. Mm -hmm. And we return to the volumes and the cruise reports, yes. which is kind of what we do now um, to find out the exact latitude, longitude of where the collection took place. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's so, so this cool. is one of our oldest specimens. That's so cool. It's beautiful. I should mention, actually, for those of uh, for those of you who are listening to the podcast, we actually have um, a YouTube channel as well. So if you'd like to move over to Knox's YouTube channel, then you can actually see what all these kind of cool specimens that we're looking yeah. at here. <laughs> and this other jar I have in front of me, it's a bit heavy. Um, it just says jar five on the outside, which suggests there were four more. <laughs> at that least. just looks like cotton wool to me. Well, that is cotton wool oh, at the top there. there. So, yeah, you were right. More, well done. interesting stuff underneath but in underneath that we have these nematine worms oh i see yeah. and this is um how they were would have been sorted and separated on board the ship when they were doing this in oh, the 1920s right. and 30s wow. and they were very good at it back then you know they had uh experts on board who could sort and identify all of the animals and give them names and preserve them properly and put them into the jars like this and this may not have been open since that time, actually. Um, so this is 1930s. <laughs> so these are some of the oldest wow. samples we and have. Where, do you know where that one came from? Well, this one's actually a collection of lots of different samples oh, okay. from different from places. Over, yeah. yeah, so it, it's um, yeah, lots of different stations. So it has the stations listed on the outside because these are all of that type of worm Got it. that's been collected perhaps yeah. during that commission yeah. to the Southern Ocean. So they were, in total, there were about, uh, there were nine expeditions between yeah. 1925 when these investigations began and 1950 oh, right. um, and most of that material is now held at the natural history museum in london okay. we have some of it here yeah. um but um we don't have the space to retain it all yeah <laughs> so some of the older material is up at, um in london but wow. we still continue to collect every year for here in southampton oh that's cool so i mean We've been collecting them then for nearly a hundred years. Um, is how we collect them any different now compared to the nineteen twenties and thirties? Yeah, so there's there's some changes and there's some things which have stayed almost exactly mm -hmm. the same. So if we think about the changes of how we collect, um, we've got more modern um, ships. Mm -hmm as I've just shown yeah. you. Yeah, so it's not a sailing ship <laughs> no. anymore. No. We, we run on diesel these days. Um, but there, and so the technology on the ship is much more advanced. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual physical methods are rather similar. So yeah. we used to use, back then they would have used trawl nets and tangle nets wow. and dredges. Yeah. And we still use trawl nets. Yeah. Um, we use corers now to um, take uh, samples mm. of the seabed as well. And we look at the smaller animals in those. Um, and of course we have the, the wonderful advent of photography mm -hmm. so we can now visualize the seafloor which is something that they couldn't do back in the 1920s 30s yeah. 40s 50s yeah <laughs> you know so there was a long time where there was a sampling blind yeah. so we're much further on in mm. that in that we can see what we're sampling yeah. now um but as far as once the samples get back on shore and how we look after them now mm -hmm. um, those techniques are largely unchanged so we still preserve the animals mm -hmm. in the same way using the same chemicals so it's formaldehyde or alcohols mm -hmm. um, and the other picture I also have in this wonderful volume back from mm -hmm. 1925 shows you that the jars that we use were exactly the same so this picture here yeah. and I'm showing you a volume here with they even took a you know made drawings of the jars yeah. that we used 
And as you can see here, we have jars which are the same as yeah, the ones which you are. have in front of you. All right, so these are, you can recognise exactly which jars. Yes, you can. <laughs> so, um, and some of these are more modern jars or mm. things that I have used more recently mm -hmm. rather than the really old ones. So yeah. I recycle and reuse Good. old jars. Yep. <laughs> um, we only replace them when they break. Um, yes. So yes, the actual methodology of back on shore of how we're looking after the mm -hmm. samples and specimens and how we sort and identify them, that's not really changed. Yeah, that's really interesting actually i wasn't sure if i was expecting that to kind of be the same or not well um, i mean there are there obviously there's there's improvements I oh mean, no being, of course being able yeah. to see of course being able to <laughs> see what's what's down there yeah lo with a live link i mean it, how much things have changed there it's, yeah. it's staggering yeah. to be able to watch live an rov camera mm. looking at these animals swimming in the deep oceans as you can now is just amazing and, yeah. and every scientist who has worked on specimens that have been long dead in preservative being able to see those things in their natural habitat live yeah. is just a joy it yeah. really is oh that's yeah. amazing that's so true actually i didn't think about that like kind of going in blind so they literally some quite often then couldn't even see the samples that they were no i mean well and and a lot of our sampling is still done like that yeah so, um we still do a trawl without a camera attached yes um but more often the ROV samples, yeah. the more selective sampling yes. that we do these days, mm. um, will bring back nicer specimens. So obviously a trawl yeah. will damage the specimens. That's true, yeah, of course. Um, but um, a camera guided, picking up a, a single specimen and putting yeah. it into a tube, mm. you'll have beautiful specimens yeah. that way. Yeah, that's um, true. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big change. It's yeah. a game changer. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, really cool. So how many specimens do we actually have in the collections? Okay, so we, we don't know. <laughs> but I'm we sure. think we can have a ballpark <laughs> estimate. Okay. So we count um, jars. Yes. So we think we've got 70,000 oh, jars okay. in our collections here in Southampton. There's about equivalent number of jars, yeah. the older material. I call it the historic discovery yeah. collections up at the Natural History Museum in London. So about 70,000 oh jars. Now, if I show you this jar again... And you look at how many worms yeah, are inside. in that yeah, jar. That's true, yeah. So one jar can contain, like this jar, one specimen, mm -hmm. or it can contain possibly 400, yeah, like this one. I was say hundreds. So yeah. if we have 70,000 jars, we're on the order of millions yeah. of specimens, and we don't have an, an, an up to date count of that yeah. at the moment. But that's yeah. something I'm working on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long job. Trying to do an inventory. Yeah. <laughs> the inventory of what we have exactly. is a major job. Oh gosh, it sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, if there's like more than 100,000, I can imagine that's going to take quite a while. No, no, more than millions. Millions, millions. of specimens. Oh, specimens, yeah. Specimens, I'm just yeah. Jars, gosh. Yep. Yeah. And, Crazy. and it's growing every year. Yeah, I bet. So we're out collecting and bringing more samples back every year yeah. as part of major programs yeah, that of are course, funded yeah. still. Wow. And where where do all these specimens come from? We've talked about a few being from the Southern Ocean. I guess I guess they're just coming from everywhere, right? Yeah. Well, we have we've had focuses, different focus over time. So, mm -hmm. um, as I've mentioned, the historic discovery collections yeah. that was funded by the government to study the the ecosystems of the whales. Oh, so that okay. was at a time when we were using whale oil and whale right. meat, and yeah. they wanted to understand how that was impacting the ecosystem of the whales in the southern ocean so nine major commissions down to the southern ocean and around that area over 25 p year period was funded to to make that study so all of that sampling is really southern ocean yeah but after the 1950s focus of our attention moved to the north atlantic mm -hmm. you know it was the change in focus from yeah. the government as these things often are mm -hmm. moved <laughs> and since then we've largely focused or we were at that point mostly focused on um, the North Atlantic there was a major campaign to the Indian Ocean or a number of, of campaigns in the 1960s to the Indian Ocean oh, yeah. and we've been back there a few times mm -hmm. um, in smaller campaigns over you know three year periods um, but but now we have a major focus still on the North Atlantic but it's on our um, porcupine abyssal plain yeah. it's called our local abyssal area and we continue to make um, like smaller focused projects, three-year projects as they're funded 
to various other places around the world. It depends where the ships are going yeah, and what's course. funded. Yeah. So we have samples from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We have samples from the Cayman Islands. We have samples from the uh, Deep Pacific and wow. Indian Oceans, Southwest Indian Ocean, everywhere, really. We're very lucky. Yeah, that's <laughs> really good. <laughs> and, like, I'm just imagining the whole range of types of specimens that, that we have in the collections... Um, and I can just see them. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, you can just see. This is a very small selection. Exactly. It's a small <laughs> selection, but I can already see the kind of different kinds of specimens that we have. Um, can you tell us a bit about the range of... Yeah, so uh, most, the majority of our samples are invertebrate samples. Okay. So animals without a backbone. Yep. So we don't focus on fish. They are all marine so obviously we're not mm -hmm. looking at freshwater animals or terrestrial animals. Mm -hmm. And that is the unique focus of the collections really is that it is devoted to the deep sea, deep sea bed and open ocean midwater animals over the years because we have had focus on whether we're working on the deep sea bed yeah. or in all of those weird animals that yeah. live in the uh, pelagic area, yeah. the midwater. Um, <laughs> but everything is deep sea or it's certainly offshore. So we yeah. don't have hardly any specimens that are less than 500 meters deep mm -hmm. or from less than 500 meters deep and yeah an incredible range diversity of animal types yeah. so we have cru um, just looking in front of me we've got crustaceans here two types of crustaceans an arthropod called a sea spider we've got holothurians which are sea cucumbers and I have bought some fish species because everybody loves fish. <laughs> um, whenever I talk to people about the Discovery Collections, they want to know about the fish because they're often the most exciting. Yeah. Um, or what people think are the most exciting. Mm. But that's because they haven't it's met true. all the other invertebrates This is true. <laughs> <laughs> and down there at the front, we've got a um, cephalopod. So it's an octopod. Oh. Um, and that... That oh, yeah. particular one, um, if you, I don't know if you can read the second part of the name of it, is called yes. Grimpetoothis <laughs> Discovery Eye. Oh, yes. And <laughs> that's it. named after the ship. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, we have a, a vast array of things down there. And the, the beauty of it is that we have the, the full range of all the animals, from, from larger animals down to absolutely tiny protozoans, um, small animals, um, everything and that means that scientists who want to study the sorts of things that we have we have a very good collection of it yeah i can see yeah. <laughs> um what's the most what would you say the most interesting specimen you have is or you've seen oh i find that very very difficult i know i was gonna That's say kind of one of the worst questions I know. to ask me because i just I, I mean, on, well, every every day that I'm working in the collections, I'll come across something say, yeah. new <laughs> and exciting. Go, wow! Have you What's seen it? I'm talking to myself when I'm. Yeah. Doing this. <laughs> wow, have you seen this, Tammy? You found this in the collection. Uh, there's generally only me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but but I, for me, it's the crustaceans because that's what I work on yeah. in my own research. That's so nice I love, really love the sea spiders. So I'm holding one up now. This is a giant sea spider. Um, called Colossendeus colossea, mm. um, which basically means giant. I was going to say, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think these are fascinatingly weird animals. Mm. Um, they, I mean, this one in the jar is all kind of curled up, but when you see them in video footage again, which you can yeah, get you can now, now, so yeah. um, the, their their legs extend out to a, the size of a dinner plate um, oh, wow. and bigger, and they'll be walking incredibly slowly yeah. across this abyssal yeah. sea floor um they're just wonderfully weird and um the the interesting thing about them is you know these this is a giant version but mm. we do get sea spiders just out there on the shore in yeah. southampton so yeah. we get sea spiders everywhere yeah but they're tiny wee yeah. things. so they're you know a, a, a centimeter long yeah. at most um but we can find their cousins yeah. on our seashore um, but the deep sea ones and the polar ones, the, the Antarctic ones are yeah. giants. Yeah. They're amazing. So they're my favourites. But I know there's lots of other favourites that other people have. Yeah. Um, I also love, of course, the giant isopod that we have. Oh, yeah. Um, we only have one of those because yeah. they're not found around our coasts. Oh, okay. um, so that was brought back to the collections by Paul Tyler, mm -hmm. who was working in the Gulf of Mexico oh, wow, uh, on yeah. various cruises at the time. He collected that and that uh, has come back to 
uh, knock and is now held here. It's used for, for teaching and things like this. And if you've not seen a giant isopod before, they're <laughs> like a um, a big woodlouse, um, but a really really big woodlouse <laughs> <laughs> that you're never going to meet. So don't worry. But uh, but they're you know this sort of size, so yeah. thirty centimeters yeah, long. Like so a it's foot in length a really kind of really big. Yeah. Um, and again, they they're scavengers that live on the deep sea bed, mm. and you can see those in video footage now as well. It's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. What about this fish-looking thing we have in the big tool jar? Oh, so this big one here, this um, this this sad-looking creature. Yeah, it's got a really sad face. Um, <laughs> but he's a a type of rat tail. So rat tails uh -huh. are very important um, scavengers again in the deep sea mm -hmm. and they're very common but this particular type we found in the collections again uh, one of my students did Jethro he found this specimen in the collections and identified it for me because I'm not the best at fish I'm a crustacean yeah. taxonomist <laughs> so I rely on lots of other people to do identifications and um, my student identified this one um, as Macroides in flaticeps. Now I call it the tadpole fish <laughs> <laughs> because it looks what. like a yeah. giant tadpole. Giant tadpole, it's yeah. Not. It's, it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's called the inflated rat tail because um, it's got a large inflated <laughs> head. Um, but it's just a beautiful animal, and we've only got one. Yeah. And some uh, some of our specimens that are rarer, mm. we try to display yeah. and showcase to the public. And I've got a lot of videos um, that we've made about these uh, star specimens, things yeah. that we um, that are rarer. So the, yeah. the giant isopod yeah. and um, giant sea spider, yeah. things that really inspire um, people to study more about the deep sea. We've made some videos, and they're on um, they're available to see on yeah. the YouTube channel. Oh, that's really cool. Out of interest, what's the largest specimen that we have? Would it be the isopod? Or do we have even bigger We've ones? got big fish. We've got some really big, um, like these ones, the rat tails, the uh, macrurids. They are, we've got some of those downstairs in yeah. the collections. And they um, they can be up to a, a metre and a half oh, in wow. length. Yeah, so um, but we don't have the capacity to store them very well. Because yeah. <laughs> how many jars do you see that are uh, that well, yeah, big? exactly. So, so we tend to have to use large barrels for yeah. that. Um, and we don't, we don't have... Uh, we don't tend to retain the fish. We try to work more on the invertebrates yeah. because mm -hmm. other people specialise on fish. But we have got some very large fish down there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's probably the largest specimens that we have. I'm just imagining like a kind of dimly lit aquarium with like <laughs> all these kind <laughs> of <laughs> funky... And we don't have creatures. any giant squid either. Oh. But we <laughs> do have giant squid beaks. Oh, right. there you go. So, yeah, so there they were collected... Uh, <laughs> Back in the early days of the historic yeah. uh, discovery collections. And I did, should have brought those down, but I didn't bring them with me today. Next but time. Yeah. <laughs> but giant squid beaks um, are, if you've ever eaten a squid mm. or seen a squid, they they have inside um, these little beaks. It looks like a parrot beak. Yeah. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I have. Yeah. yeah. So they're quite small, aren't they? And you yeah. have to take them out yeah. in order to eat a squid. Um, now, the giant squid beak that yeah. we've got is, you know, it's about that sort of size, oh, wow. parrot beak. Parrot so beak if size. you imagine much bigger, no, bigger than a parrot oh, beak Oh, bigger size. than parrots. Yeah, so my hand size like yeah. this. Oh, wow. So, um, and you can imagine the size of the squid yeah. scaling it Oof. up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> they were found in <laughs> sperm whale stomachs. Oh, right. When the original discovery yeah. investigations, they did lots of whale studies yeah. as well as part of those uh, investigations. Oh, wow. Well, so, yeah. there you go. They've got some weird stuff. From yeah, there, <laughs> well, I can see just by the ones in front of me. <laughs> um, so how do they, how do all these specimens contribute to ocean science today? Right, well, um, I've said at the beginning that there's so many things mm. that specimens can do for us. Yeah. Um, one of the major things and, and the focus of my research mm. is taxonomy. Yeah. So that's describing the new species that we find. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, I mean, it's, it's a fundamental part of all biological studies is knowing what animal you're studying. Right, yeah. Right? So <laughs> if you want to understand how an animal is uh, processing carbon, for example, yeah. or um, transporting carbon, uh -huh. um, or how it's respiring. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing you have to know is, what is it? Yeah. Not, how it's is true. it respiring? Yeah. If you want to write a publication or study something in more detail, the first thing is, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that is absolutely a fundamental um, building block of mm. all biological science mm -hmm. is taxonomy. So there's one thing. 
So in addition to that, um, we want to make to understand what is in the oceans and how it is changing. So if we think about climate change mm. um, and things like ocean acidification, we need to be able to say what lived at a place at right. a particular point yep. in time, mm -hmm. which is what I explained at the start. Yes, exactly, this is what yeah. our our sampling mm -hmm. gives us. So we, although I've got all of these animals in separate jars, mm -hmm. what we're actually looking at when we're building, when we're studying them and when we bring them on the deck is a community of animals. We're mm -hmm. not just looking at this fish here and this sea spider here. Mm -hmm. We're looking at, at all of the animals that mm -hmm. live in a particular place. Yeah. And so as scientists, what we do is we collect the animals or we sample an area and then we identify everything that lives there and count how many of each of the things mm -hmm. are there. And then we can possibly go back and look at how that's changed um, the next year, the yeah, next that makes five sense. years. And this is called an environmental baseline. Yeah. So it's like a baseline picture of yeah. what lives there. Without a good, strong baseline, we can't say how the environment is changing. Mm. So that's a large part of what the research, that the contribution to ocean science is um, environmental change. Mm. And we're doing this on an annual basis at the Porcupine Abyssal Plain, right. which is one of our major um, study areas. So that is just off, if you if you carry on for a very long way or about a, a day's sail um, off of Southwest Ireland, you'll get to something, an area called the Porcupine Abyssal yep. Plain. And that our study site there is 4,850 metres deep, so almost five oh, kilometres. Wow. Have you ever run five kilometres? Yep. Yep. If you do your couch to 5K, I mean, right, yeah, it's, it takes you about half an hour. Uh, well, it takes me about half yeah, an hour. Least, yeah. Yeah. Some, <laughs> some people can do it quicker. Yeah. <laughs> but, but quite frankly, if you imagine running straight down for half an hour, that's how far it is. It's a really long way down. It's <laughs> such a long way down. Yeah. And, it, and when you just say 4,000 metres or yeah. whatever, or Bissell Plain, it's very difficult to quantify yeah. how far that is. But I like to think of it as the 5K run yeah, straight down. Um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good to visualise it. Yeah. Um, so we collect uh, samples. We sample the entire water column. Mm. Um, so there's scientists who are studying, looking at what's happening in the upper ocean yeah. and uh, at the flux down towards the seabed. Mm -hmm. And our part in the discovery collections part is looking at the animals right on the seabed. So we trawl the sample, the, the seabed, and we take cores, um, sediment cores, and we look at the tiny little animals that mm -hmm. live in there. And every year we bring them back and we sort them out, <laughs> identify <laughs> them, yep. count them. And there's about, I think it's about 2,000 animals uh, of the bigger animals per year, not including all the tiny weeny animals. Mm -hmm. And my own research, I also look at the little amphipod shrimps that yeah. are collected there. So... Um, yeah, so it's a major study area. And we've been go doing this process since 1989. Oh, right. Um, and 1985 for the scavenger scavenging amphipods, which I mm. study. So it's, it's a really long-term study, mm. and it's pretty much the only one in the world that looks at those things over time at abyssal depths. So mm. it's a unique global study. Yeah, that's great. Out of interest, have you noticed any changes over that time period? Yes, there's been a lot of change. Mm. Um, so we're still going out there every year, yeah. but we have seen decadal scale changes mm. um, of orders of magnitude in, in particular, the holothurians, which are sea cucumbers. I mustn't use the funny word, <laughs> the holothurian <laughs> <Yeah>. word. So <laughs> sea cucumbers, and now I've got, a, I'm holding up an example here. This one's called Dima. Um, this is a sea pig. It's mm -hmm. common name sea pig, yeah. so people may know it as a sea pig. They're cute little things. We've got <laughs> those. And then there should be possibly by you a big purple thing, which looks oh, like yeah. a giant tongue. Big. Yep. One of these so ones. that is um, Benthodites. That's yeah. another big sea cucumber. Now, sea cucumbers on the deep sea bed are, they're kind of roaming around on the abyssal yeah. sea floor, processing all the mm -hmm. sediment, eating all the things, which falls like manna from heaven. Yeah. Um, so everything floats <laughs> down. These uh, marine snow arrives on the seabed. And the animals like the holothurians, which are really important in the deep sea, are going around, eating it up, processing all this fresh uh, detritus from yeah. above. And we've seen changes of an order of magnitude um, in the sea cucumbers 
at the deep sea bed mm. in particular particular years have seen huge great abundances and you know you go back the next year or the next few years and mm. it's gone right down to nothing oh, right. um and it's a it's something that we're now looking at uh, across all of the of the invertebrates mm -hmm. at the seabed and we think it's to do with the change in quality and quantity of flux of Okay. Uh, the detritus, the yeah. manna, the food that they're feeding yeah, food on. Source, yeah. So yeah, uh, and that is of course uh, impacted by change in the upper ocean. Yes. So we're effectively we're seeing change, possibly climate change. Yeah. Five kilometers deep. Yeah. Wow, that kind of goes back to the previous podcast where we had um, Steph Henson. Mm -hmm. We were talking about how important all the different interactions are between all the different exactly, layers yeah. and all the different organisms and everything. Gosh, that's really interesting. Um, so, that, I mean, that what Steph is doing, she's looking at the flux. Yes, and no, exactly. And, 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 the, yeah. and the plankton poo, which the she talks poo, about. Exactly right? So she's talking, talking about. about the plankton poo. That's, <laughs> that plankton poo is what eventually reaches, yeah. is the food for these sea yeah. cucumbers. So the change at that, changes she's looking that. at changes. Yeah. We're looking at changes in that. She's looking at how that changes yeah. as flux changes and what, what impacts. Yeah. Making, yeah. So, th I mean, it, but that's the great thing about, working here at NOC is that yeah. we work together collaboratively exactly. with people in different um, fields. You know, we're looking at these yeah. sea cucumber numbers and they're looking at the plankton poo yeah. that's feeding exactly. our sea cucumbers. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's all just so interesting. I'm kind of like mesmerised by these jars <laughs> in front of me. At the moment. Every um, day. For me. I know, I can imagine, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I don't get much done. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can anyone come and see the collection? Um, well, this collection is a little bit closed because it's so it's we're not a public museum, right? Um, but we do accept visitors of who want to come and s scientific visitors who want to study the collections. But there is opportunities to visit the specimens mm -hmm. currently in an exhibition down in the National Maritime Museum in Falmouth in Cornwall, oh, okay. and it's called Monsters of the Deep, Ooh. and it's a fantastic exhibition because it's it's not just about my samples mm -hmm. it follows the the legends and the stories of monsters because back in the day there here here be monsters wasn't yeah. it? it was written on the maps yeah here be monsters and so it follows that story of these legends of sea monsters and it's the the, the legend and the reality and so right at the end of the exhibition is you know they've talked all the way about the monsters but then we talk about the real monsters so people yeah. consider these monstrous i yeah. don't no. but but some people do. And so we <laughs> have we, they show, showcase the real monsters of the deep yeah. at the end of the exhibition. So you can go down there and you can see these star specimens. Um, and there's uh, video footage of each of the star specimens and a subset of the Discovery Collections and Boaty McBoatface is down oh, there, there as well. Oh, So you can learn about <laughs> oceanography as and well. uh, see yeah. some of the models of the ship and the original Challenger um, laboratory has been recreated down oh, there. Oh, great. So yeah. it's a fantastic exhibition, and it goes on until January 2023, Yeah. at which point I've got a lot of work to do to bring everything back. Yes, I can imagine. Check it all over, <laughs> and then move it to Chatham in Kent. Oh, so it's on, it's on it's, tour? Yes, it's on <laughs> tour. It's going to Chatham Historic <laughs> Dockyard, and that opens, I think, in April 23. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a lot of work between <laughs> early next year to get it all moved and reset up. That's but, yeah. great. Well, now everyone knows where to go to go and have a look if they would like to. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's been really, really interesting, especially to, well, to hear all about them, but also for me to see all, all of them as well. <laughs> it's been really great. It's a pleasure. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the Discovery Collections, visit our website, knock.ac.uk, and head over to our Under the Surface pages. If you'd like to see some of the monsters of the deep with your own eyes, head over to our YouTube channel to watch this episode, as well as some star specimens. We'll see you in the next episode.